Oh God, that is the cry of our hearts. Lord Jesus, you are the balm for our soul. You are our comfort in a troubled and troubling world. As we walk under the sun, facing our own frailties, encountering the consequences of our sins and the sins of others, feeling the weight of the curse, the curse on work, the curse on creation. We need something beyond the sun. We need your son. I pray, O oh God, that as we look to your word this morning, that you would do a work in our hearts to lift our gaze from this horizontal plane, to set our affections on you. And truly, the thought of Christ is our panacea, our peace, our joy, our delight, our treasure. And God, you know us, we are so easily distracted, we are so easily tempted by things evil, we are so easily tempted by things good to lift them higher than they should be lifted. We think of those early followers of you in John 6 who after the masses were fed and you spoke truth and nearly everyone walked away and you asked them, would you go away too? And their response is, I pray our response. Where else would we go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. And even if we can't understand, we trust you. And we believe, O oh Lord, but help our unbelief. And at times our mustard seed-sized faith is so puny. And our enemies are so great and our problems loom so large. But the best thing about our faith is not its quality, but its object. And Lord, that is you. And we need you. And we need you in these moments to give us clarity for life, an eternal perspective, and above all, show us your son. And we ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would conform us into his image, even now giving us ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts to obey your words. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Our text this morning is Ecclesiastes chapter 10. We'll begin our time by reading it. Let's listen together to... The words of God through his servant Solomon, king over Israel. Dead flies make a perfumer's oil stink. So a little foolishness is weightier than wisdom and honor. A wise man's heart directs him toward the right, but the foolish man's heart directs him toward the left. Even when the fool walks along the road, his sense is lacking, and he demonstrates to everyone that he is a fool. If the ruler's temper rises against you, do not abandon your position, because composure allays great offenses. There is an evil I have seen under the sun, like an error which goes forth from the ruler. Folly is set in many exalted places, which, while rich men sit in humble places... I have seen slaves riding on horses and princes walking like slaves on the land. He who digs a pit may fall into it, and a serpent may bite him who breaks through a wall. He who quarries stones may be hurt by them, and he who splits logs may be endangered by them. If the axe is dull and he does not sharpen its edge, then he must exert more strength. Wisdom has the advantage of giving success. If the serpent bites before being charmed, there is no profit for the charmer. Words from the mouth of a wise man are gracious, while the lips of a fool consume him. The beginning of his talking is folly, and the end of it is wicked madness. Yet the fool multiplies words. No man knows what will happen, and who can tell him what will come after him? The toil of a fool so wearies him that he does not even know how to go to a city. Woe to you, O land, whose king is a lad, 
and whose princes feast in the morning. Blessed are you, O land, whose king is of nobility and whose princes eat at the appropriate time for strength and not for drunkenness. Through indolence, the rafters sag, and through slackness, the house leaks. Men prepare a meal for enjoyment, and wine makes life merry, and money is the answer to everything. Furthermore, in your bedchamber, do not curse a king, and in your sleeping rooms, do not curse a rich man. For a bird of the heavens will carry the sound, and the winged creature will make the matter known. There's a lot of ground to cover this morning, and you may feel sort of disjointed in reading Ecclesiastes 10 all in a piece. Are are these things connected? Are these ideas unified by some central theme, or are these just a series of sort of popcorn statements thrown up against each other in a weird apposition? Whatever you perceive of the unity of Ecclesiastes 10, I I think you already can understand that there will be some practical benefit for everyone here in this room, a a whole smattering of considerations and situations are looked at in this chapter. We see in this chapter the benefits of wisdom, the dangers of foolishness, and once again, the sovereignty of God. Here, wisdom and folly are applied to a a whole array of specific circumstances. And the unifying theme in this chapter is simply this. It continues the thoughts that we looked at last week from Ecclesiastes 9. Wisdom is good, but it is not a guarantee. Wisdom is good, but it is not God. My application of wise principles will be helpful for living life in a broken world. But my application of wise principles cannot change the nature of my world, populated by sinners, reeling from the effects of the fall, under the curse of God. And you know, that's a good thing. It is a good thing that my right living, my wise living, my appropriate application of the best principles around cannot change my world. God knows that if I could just tweak my behavior, adjust my thinking, perfect my practices so that I no longer feel the curse nor face the consequences of my sin or other sin, then I could make a comfortable little existence, a little home here for myself. I I could find satisfaction and fulfillment in something less than I was designed for. A comfortable, easy existence is what we often find ourselves longing for, pining for, striving for. But a comfortable, comfortable, easy existence is elusive. We praise God that it is elusive, for if we got it, we wouldn't seek Him. And we wouldn't trust Him. And we wouldn't long for heaven. And we wouldn't make it our daily, base, uh, daily business to secure heaven For everyone that we meet. My hope in this life, my security in this life, my safety in this life is not found in my ability to be wise. God is my rock. God is my fortress. He is my security. He is my help, my hope, my stronghold, and my safety. There's a very real danger for us that we would take God's wisdom and replace God with it. As if if I just follow these rules and check off these boxes and do these things, I can make my life go the way I want. The reality is we are to be wise, but we are never to worship wisdom. To elevate wisdom the wrong way is to elevate our own selves, to elevate our own abilities to accomplish wise living. You and I ought to run away from foolishness. But we also must run away from the pride of trusting in our own wisdom. There's something else, something worse perhaps that we could do with wisdom. We could turn wisdom into a tool for expecting God to make my circumstances work out the way that I want them. Simply because I followed His instructions, God is now obligated to give me what I want. 
We make God the servant of our own fleshly desires. The reality is God is God, and He will not be bought off by our formulas or our good behavior. You see, it honors God when we apply His wisdom in our daily living. It dishonors God when we begin to trust in our ability to apply His wisdom. God is honored when His people trust Him, doing life His way, accepting with gratitude whatever situations He brings us. And God is dishonored when we complain, especially when we we complain that God owes us something in return for doing things His way. This is why Jeremiah in the book of Lamentations, looking over the destruction of Jerusalem in the siege, says, who can complain in view of his sins? And we think rightly about who we are and what we deserve. We ought never complain against God. And so this chapter is going to commend for us some wisdom and warn us about folly and remind us that God is still sovereign. That even if I eschew all folly and embrace all wisdom, I'm still subject to God being God. He gets to order my life and my circumstances in the ways that he sees fit. So this morning, let's be eager to hear from God a series of statements about the benefits of wisdom and the dangers of foolishness and to be reminded once again that he is in charge. By way of organizing Ecclesiastes 10, I've just broken this up into eight observations about wisdom and folly under the sun. Eight observations about wisdom and folly under the sun. Under the sun. The first observation is simply this folly is disadvantageous. Folly is disadvantageous. Verses 1 to 4. Dead flies make a perfumer's oil stink. So a little foolishness is weightier than wisdom and honor. A wise man's heart directs him towards the right, but the foolish man's heart directs him toward the left. Even when the fool walks along the road, his sense is lacking, and he demonstrates to everyone that he is a fool. If the ruler's temper rises against you, do not abandon your position, because composure allays great offenses. Solomon here is lifting up foolishness or folly for us to examine and to recognize that it's disadvantageous to live according to foolishness. The first disadvantage of foolishness is that it only takes a little. It only takes a, a smidgen of foolishness to ruin a whole lifetime of Wisdom, how does Solomon say this in verse 1? The fly in the ointment. You've heard that before. It comes from right here, Ecclesiastes 10.1. A dead fly makes a perfumer's oil stink. Think about the ingredients in the nicest bottle of perfume one could buy. How much would it cost? How much did it cost to put all those ingredients in? How much work would it take? And now how valuable is that nearly priceless commodity in a small jar. And yet some insignificant little insect, buzzing around in the wrong time, in the wrong place, finds its way into the jar and decomposes and ruins the whole thing. I like the King James. The King James Version of the Bible says it this way. It causes to send forth a stinking savor. It takes far less effort to ruin something than to build something. You knew this when you were a kid, that when you were in preschool or some daycare program and you had the blocks and you're very painstakingly setting them up. What is that tower of blocks? It's only a temptation for another four-year-old to come by and completely demolish them. And how long does that take? Have you ever set up the domino train? You're about 80% done with this amazing display of stood-up dominoes. And you accidentally bump one. And the whole thing, and it's done. Gone. One little fault ruins all the productivity. You know this on a sports team, in a classroom, in a company, a business, or in a home. One single person. Or one bad decision, one foul temper, one careless mistake can bring to ruin an entire organization or bring destruction to an entire family. Consider your own heart, your own life. A lifetime of good choices can be squandered with one bad one. 
It only takes a little bit of foolishness. The second statement about the disadvantages of folly is that foolishness is patently unhelpful. It just doesn't accomplish anything good. The way Solomon says this is in verse 2. A wise man's heart directs him toward the right, but the foolish man's heart directs him toward the left. Now, on a week like this, we might think he's talking about politics. He's not talking about politics. (laughs) He's talking about the way the ancient world viewed the right hand and the left hand. The Latin word for left hand is where we get our English word sinister. In the French language, the word is gauche. Uh, The idea is the the left hand was not seen as honorable, it was not seen as useful, it was not seen as powerful. And apologies already to all of you uh, left-handed people in the room. Uh, In our day, we value left-handers. They're more creative or they're fantastic pitchers in baseball. They have significant advantages in various athletic enterprises. But in the ancient world, the, the left hand was seen as a a hand of dishonor, even of wrongness. And the right hand was useful and honorable and correct and upright and was a place of strength, even a place of protection. And so what is Solomon saying here? The, the, the wise man directs him toward that which is right, toward that which is honorable, toward that which is useful, profitable, beneficial. And the foolish man, where, where are his inclinations? Where is the trajectory of his inner being towards that which is unhelpful, even harmful? Tremendous disadvantage. If, if the very way you are bent from the inside is toward that which brings about destruction rather than that which brings about help, that's a disadvantage. There's a third way that folly is disadvantageous. is in verse 3. Uh, Folly makes itself obvious. Eventually, look what Solomon says. Even when the fool walks along the road, his sense is lacking, and he demonstrates to everyone that he is a fool. What is this man doing? Well, he's just going about his business. He's just walking. And yet, it's like he's wearing a t-shirt that says, I am a fool. He's got a great big neon sign emblazoned over his head with an arrow that says, fool, fool, fool. What does that mean? It means the the, the way his mind works, the way his heart is inclined, the trajectory of his life becomes obvious outward. People can see that he's a fool just by the things he is doing. The foolishness in his heart eventually exhibits itself outwardly in behavior. And literally Solomon says, his heart is lacking. The the New American Standard translates heart as sense. Uh, That is his sensibilities, the the way he thinks. We might think of this as his mind. Uh, We might say this man is brainless. And eventually, the inability to think makes itself obvious in what he does. It's like the criminal attempting to defend himself in a court of law, enlisting the tactics that he learned from TV court dramas. Everybody else in the room knows that he's not wise. This man doesn't have to tell anyone that he is a fool. Everyone can see it. There's a fourth disadvantage to folly in verse 4. Foolishness loses its composure. And really at a critical time, listen to the way Solomon describes this. If the ruler's temper rises against you, do not abandon your position because composure allays great offenses. The wise man has control over his own emotions. In a difficult situation, uh, that self-control is a a timely help. The fool has not learned this power, but he gives in to whatever he feels in the moment. He has no self-control. He has not learned a mastery over what he thinks and what he does. Losing one's composure in the court of an earthly monarch. You don't like what the king says? You're going to tell him off. Uh, Losing your composure in that context often meant losing your life. Not smart. You see, the wise man can stand his ground, even in the face of an angry king, because a wise man has integrity. Uh, The wise man has his fear and his trust set above and beyond the earthly king. He is one who fears God. He is one who trusts in God. 
Listen, integrity gives one great boldness. Consider Daniel and his friends before the earthly Babylonian kings. They could stand on their conviction and they could do so with composure. Now, this is an interesting perspective coming from Solomon, who is the king. The thing about that, Solomon as a king is revealing some inside information here. <laughs> he, he's letting us know from his perspective what it's like when various kinds of people come into the king's court. When the king gets angry, but the person who is the current target of his fury is unmoved, even a king who doesn't have to answer to anyone may second guess his anger. So, stand your ground, keep your composure. On the other side, if you abandon your position, if the king is mad and you try to fly out of there or, or, or argue or, or panic, the king will assume that you were wrong anyway or that you lacked integrity or that you lacked courage. There's great wisdom in a man who is willing to take his lumps calmly for his convictions. And the king says, Solomon says, that's a man that a king might even listen to. This is similar to Solomon's proverb elsewhere, that a gentle answer turns away wrath. Here you're at the mercy of a king. And Solomon's advice is keep your composure. Foolishness, the disadvantage of being a fool, is that you're without self-control over how you feel and what you do, and you're apt to lose your composure at a critical moment. Point number two in our outline is this. Wisdom is advantageous. Wisdom is advantageous, but it can't guarantee outcomes. We looked at the disadvantages of folly. Now we look at the advantages of wisdom. But with this caveat, <laughs> wisdom is no guarantee. We still have to factor into the equation a cursed world, sinful people, consequences of sin, and the unpredictability of the sovereignty of God. What do we learn about wisdom in verses 5 to 11? Well, Wisdom improves one's prospects for success, but it cannot overrule the sovereignty of God. The practice of wisdom improves one's prospects, but cannot overturn the depravity of man. We see, first of all, in verses 5 to 7, that fools sometimes succeed. Look what Solomon says. There is an evil I have seen under the sun, like an error which goes forth from the ruler, Folly is set in many exalted places while rich men sit in humble places. I have seen slaves riding on horses and princes walking like slaves on the land. Solomon's own son, instead of listening to wise counsel, listened to his buddies, his peers, his friends to make decisions affecting the nation. And the result of that was disastrous and the splitting of the kingdom. What Solomon calls an evil here, which again, that word does not necessarily describe a moral calamity, uh, some heinous moral crime. It can mean that. Uh, but it just has the basic meaning of something bad, something very distasteful, something awful. And the awful thing Solomon has seen under the sun is that things don't turn out like they seem like they should. And so the wrong guys get into positions of power. Uh, the wrong kinds of people end up having influence. Uh, the, the roles are, the, are, are reversed. and People weasel their way into bureaucratic positions for self-interest rather than for serving others. Folly is set in many exalted places. The position and the character of the person holding the position don't fit. Solomon says that is an evil. Next, Solomon lets us know that unintended consequences sometimes occur. Wisdom is advantageous, but we can't control the outcomes. And in verses 8 and 9, we see there are unintended consequences to the things that we do. He says, he who digs a pit may fall into it. And he doesn't tell us if someone is digging a pit for good purposes or nefarious purposes. Are you digging a pit in order to trap somebody and you fall into your own pit? Is that the idea? Or... Are you digging a pit for some use, useful purpose? Maybe a holding tank for water for your cattle and, and you fall in. You may be exercising wisdom and you can't predict a misstep. You might be 
thoughtfully planning ahead for the provision of your farm, your family, your business, and you can't see what's coming and an accident happens. He says in the second half of verse 8, a serpent may bite him who breaks through a wall. You never know what's behind that wall. You're pulling apart stones, and, and in, in the land of Israel, uh, currently there are some 20 types of venomous snakes. You, you're doing some remodeling. You're pulling apart a wall. You might be very wise in, in doing something that's productive and helpful for your home, and, and you get bit by a poisonous snake. You can't predict that. You might be acting with all the wisdom you should be acting with. And then he says in verse 9, He who quarries stones may be hurt by them. Whether you just throw your back out by picking up heavy rocks or whether the rock falls on your toe, uh, you can be hurt by doing something that's productive, something that's helpful. Now Solomon here isn't picking on things that are bad activities, but good, productive, uh, even wise activities in their times. And, and we can't predict what happens. He says in the second half of verse 9, He who splits logs may be endangered by them. I had a pile of firewood I was going through at our home in Nashville a number of years ago and uh, came down to chop a piece of wood. I was feeling really excited, you know, get to be a, a lumberjack for about an hour once a year and do something productive and, and uh, feel manly and, and I hit a, hit a log and it went sideways and it bounced off a wall and came back and hit me and gave me a nice gash and a bruise at the same time and Janet locked the axe up so that I couldn't get to it for a while. <laughs> Things happen. And we can be endangered by doing the right things. He says next in verse 10, if the axe is dull and he does not sharpen its edge, then he must exert more strength. Wisdom has the advantage of giving success. And the lesson here is that the wise make necessary preparations. The wise make necessary preparations. You sharpen the axe before you begin to use it. I know it's going to take a little extra time, but it's actually going to speed up the job, make the job safer, make the job go faster if you're using the right tool in the right way and you've made the appropriate preparations. When the laymans lived with us, Jeremy Layman took all of our kitchen knives and sharpened them. These things work. <laughs> it was like a revelation. You can sharpen knives. I mean, all of us get a, a knife sharpener with that knife block. How many of us use it? Well, Jeremy Lehman used it, <laughs> and it's like we had new knives. You might say, I don't want to waste time sharpening my axe. I just want to get the job done, and you find out that you waste much more time and much more energy struggling to get through your task with a blunt instrument. So change the oil in your car. At 3,000 miles, the car will run better. The car will last longer. Your air conditioning system at home will work better if you change the filters once a month. Take those things out. Get new filters. Uh, I know what you're doing after lunch today. You're going to Home Depot. <laughs> Brush your teeth twice a day. It may seem like a lot of work right at the moment, but it's going to make your teeth last longer. You get the right tool for the job. Maybe you read up on how to do something before you do it. Uh, read the directions, men. Before you start to assemble that piece of furniture from Ikea. Maybe before you start dating, sharpen your biblical knowledge about what marriage is, what love should look like, and what it means to honor God through leadership and through submission. Before you become a parent or when you realize that you are one, go to God's word to sharpen your understanding of what that role should look like. The ax cuts much better when it's sharp. Another lesson about the advantages of wisdom comes in verse 11. Solomon says, if the serpent bites before being charmed, there's no profit for the charmer. What is the point here? Timing is something Timing is something. Uh, the, the one who would handle snakes, especially venomous, poisonous snakes, you could do that for a couple of reasons. Um, 
that it, I, I can't think of any good ones, really, but uh, <laughs> snake charmers were hired for entertainment. Oh, look at this viper. I can make this viper do what I want it to do, and it won't bite me, and I can sell tickets. Um, I don't know who would do that. But snake charmers were also hired to get rid of venomous snakes. When you were breaking through a wall and you found one in the wall, and how am I going to get rid of that thing? I'm not reaching in there to get it. Well, you bring somebody in who can sort of lull the snake into submission and remove it for you. But what good is the snake charmer if it bites before you hire him? Or if it bites before he gets there? Or if it's the entertainment style of snake charmer, what good is all of his training, all of his talent, all of his skills if the snake bites him before it's hypnotized? It's fruitless. As Solomon is saying that the timing is important. Timing is something. It would probably be too much to say that timing is everything. Right? You could get there at the right time but not know how to handle snakes. That wouldn't help you. <laughs> but timing is something. Timing is something. And often timing is critical. There's the third section in our outline. Third section. It comes in verses 12 to 14. And it is the observation that folly proceeds out of the mouth. If there's foolishness in the heart, eventually it comes out of our words. Solomon says in verses 12 to 14, Words from the mouth of a wise man are gracious, while the lips of a fool consume him. The beginning of his talking is folly, and the end of it is wicked madness. Yet the fool multiplies words. No man knows what will happen, and who can tell him what will come after him? We could break the folly from the mouth into three parts. First of all, foolish words are destructive, verse 12. In contrast to the words from the mouth of the wise, they're gracious. The lips of the fool consume him. Foolish thoughts coming out in foolish words are self-destructive. In the end, you consume yourself by them. The second observation Solomon makes about folly coming out of the mouth is in verse 13. And it is the trajectory of folly in speaking. The end is what? Wicked madness. An evil insanity. And we might think, oh yeah, the fool, he's the, the sort of dunce, the class clown. He, he, he's cute and sort of silly and, and that's all right. He, he'll grow out of it. That's not the way the Bible portrays the fool. Read the book of Proverbs and survey who the fool is. The fool is one who is not submitted to the fear of Yahweh. The fool is one who is committed to his own autonomy, committed to his own elevated impressions of himself, thinks he knows everything. The fool is said of his own heart, everything's good here. The fool doesn't trust God. The fool is hell-bound. The fool is under the enmity and judgment of God himself. The, the fool is not a, a cute little class clown that we hope grows out of it. The, the fool is an intentional rebel against God and his ways. And the trajectory spelled out in verse 13 is a, a wicked madness. An insane evil that ends in destruction. And in verse 14, we see the words of the fool are profuse. Talks a lot listens little, full of himself. One commentator said, words are too often the substitute for thinking. Right? In the, in the pursuit of God and the fear of the Lord, there is to be a listening to God. There is to be a Psalm 1 meditating on the Word of God. And one who just talks and talks and talks and talks is demonstrating himself to be a fool. Solomon wrote in Proverbs, where words are many, sin is sure to follow. There's a lot of wisdom in being a good listener, stopping long enough to ponder, to think. There's a fourth observation about folly. It's in verse 15. Folly is wearying. Look what Solomon says. The toil of a fool so wearies him that he does not even know how to go to a city. He's forgotten how to get from point A to point B because he is so exhausted. What is the fool exhausted by? He's exhausted by the toil of his folly. It's sort of like cutting a cord of wood with a dull axe. Living foolishly will wear you out. You see, when you make a foolish decision, 
if you think in terms of decision trees, you then limit your options for wise decisions subsequent to a foolish decision. I'll give you an example. I was trying to dig, dig up a grapevine from my backyard last week. And I hadn't dug enough dirt from around the grapevine to move it from one place to another. Hadn't got enough dirt away from the roots. And I had an old spade shovel. And I thought, well, I'll just take a shortcut here. I'll put the spade shovel in as deep as it can go, jump up and down on it, get it down there nice and deep, and then just use the leverage. Snap! Spade shovel's done. Oh, man, can't use that. I made a foolish decision. Now what are my options? I had a spade shovel that I could have used to dig out more dirt to get away from the roots to move the grapevine. Now I don't have a spade shovel. I still have a transfer shovel. I'll stick that under there. Ka-chunk. Snap. One foolish decision led to fewer options. Another foolish decision, fewer options still. Now what do I have left? Hand tools. Down on my hands and knees, digging out this dirt. Folly is wearying. Making bad decisions, which seem like a shortcut at the front end, which seem like something that would be great to do, end up costing you more in the end. So much so that the fool in verse 15 doesn't even know where he's going. I think the implication here is supposed to be something familiar, supposed to be something easy to do. He can't perform an easy task. He's so worn out from the consequences of his foolishness. There's a fifth observation. It comes in verses 16 and 17. Folly and wisdom both rise to power. If we'd read this far, we would think, well, I mean, positions of of power and influence really ought to go to the wise. They ought to, but they don't always. So Solomon levels this curse. Woe to you, O land, verse 16, whose king is a lad and whose princes feast in the morning. What's wrong with a young king? I mean, Hezekiah was young. Solomon himself was young when he became king. What did Solomon do? Solomon said, Oh God, I'm young. I need help to lead these people. I need wisdom to know right from wrong. And I need to know how to govern. Solomon was a lad, but he was humble. And wise enough to know that he wasn't wise enough. Hezekiah, as you know, was a a lad who feared the Lord. Who clung to the Lord and no one was like him. And he camped out in God's word. But the young kings in verse 16. They feast in the morning. What's the problem? They're partying at 10 o'clock a.m. They're not doing what kings ought to do. They're not doing what princes ought to do. They're using the resources of the nation for their own benefit. They're filling their pockets with luxury and excess off the backs of the people. They're not governing. They're partying. And not at the right times. Solomon's already told us there's a time for feasting. There's a time for parties. Not in the morning if you're a king. You have another job to do. Romans 13 tells us that kings are held accountable for that very thing. The contrast to that is in verse 17. A blessing on a land with wise leaders... Blessed are you, O land, whose king is of nobility, whose princes eat at the appropriate time. And and it's not about just when they eat, but why they eat. Verse 17, for strength, not for gluttony, drunkenness, excess, not for luxury's sake. Uh, They're using the resources at their disposal in order to be good at the task before them. What a blessing to a land that kind of king is. You might think, well, that's what we need to have. No, we wouldn't deserve it. (laughs) We're a population of sinners and rebels against God. God is kind to give us governance of any sort to prevent anarchy. But it sure is a grace of God when there's wise people in leadership. It sure is a scourge when there are fools in leadership. 
A sixth observation, verse 18, folly has consequences. Folly has consequences. Solomon says, through indolence, the rafters sag, and through slackness, the house leaks. He's connecting here laziness and folly. You know, the fool is one who is so lazy. In the book of Proverbs, the fool is so lazy that he, he, he can't even lift his hand from the dish to his mouth. He, he's hunted down his prey. He's roasted his prey. He's prepared the dish, but he doesn't finish the deal by lifting the spoon to his face. And so he starves. Someone who doesn't finish things well, uh, someone who is lazy is, in the Bible, considered a fool. And what are the consequences of that foolishness in this verse? Well, the, the roof is sagging. The rafters are bending. They, they could have been well-maintained, and the house would stand for a long time, but the house has not been well-maintained, and so it leaks. This is a, an issue of cause and effect. Foolishness has consequences. They may not be seen immediately, but they will be evident over time. And we also recognize the sovereignty of God here. A well-maintained house can be destroyed by some disaster. And a poorly maintained house could stand longer than expected. But the general course of things is a cause and effect between folly and disaster. It may take time. It may be imperceptible in the moment. But it will come. Seventh observation. Wisdom uses resources for their intended purposes. Look at verse 19. Men prepare a meal for enjoyment, and wine makes life merry, and money is the answer to everything. Now, the question we have to ask about food and drink and money is not, are they inherently evil or not? No, that's not the issue. But what are they for? What are they for? The Bible is full of warnings about drunkenness, about gluttony, and about... Wealth, lots of warnings. But the Bible doesn't demand that those things are intrinsically evil in and of themselves. They have a purpose. So in the New Testament, Paul can instruct the rich how to use their riches. Solomon and Ecclesiastes can tell us how to eat our food and how to drink our wine. And none of these things are designed by God to grant us ultimate fulfillment. They are designed for something else. The question is, in what way will the wise man use these resources? In what way will the fool use these resources? An axe in the hand of a skilled lumberjack is a tool, a good thing. An axe in the hand of a violent criminal is something awful, a destructive weapon. It's not the axe that is the problem. It is the person in whose hand it is wielded. Think about how money is employed in the stewardship of a wise, content, generous man who fears God. That's a great resource. And Solomon's statement here, money is the answer to everything. It may sound like overstatement. I think it rings from Solomon's experience. Under the sun, you can get things done with money. You can get things done with money. There's a principle that flows over into the New Testament for us as well. What does God tell us to do with our resources here on this earth? Um, buy for ourselves things that last into eternity. Do things with our resources that matter forever. Now, that principle is here too. In verse 20, we see an eighth observation about wisdom and folly. Wisdom guards its speech. Solomon says, Furthermore, in your bedchamber, do not curse a king, and in your sleeping rooms, do not curse a rich man, for a bird of the heavens will carry the sound, and the winged creature will make the matter known. Again, Solomon speaking as a king, it's like this has happened. <laughs> He's heard things that people wouldn't have wanted the king to hear. How did he hear them? A little birdie told me. I think that's where we get that phrase right here in Ecclesiastes 10. We might not say a little birdie in our day. We might say a wiretap told me, an email hack told me, a micro drone told me. I'll read to you from one author. Cautioning us about 
how we speak when we think no one is listening. It is dangerous to speak where secrecy is required. The thought is your own while you keep it to yourself. But once the cage is opened and the bird is let loose, who knows how far its flight might bear it. At first you think of tying it by the foot. You tell your secret to a single friend. He tells it to another who mentions it to a chosen few. The cord is loosened and then it is slipped. Your bird will no more roost in secrecy. Learn to keep your secret to yourself. It is snug to know the bird is in the cage, securely fastened. And though it flutter against the bars, desiring its liberty, still keep it close. No harm will it do while there. What mischief it might do if let loose, you know not. If you think evil of a man, what need to mention it? His faults are known to you, why repeat them? Who has a right to ask? God suffered you to know these that you might pray for him and not harm him and others by spreading his dishonor. But if you harbor thoughts against the man and not against the sin, most probably the thought will out and will injure you. It's convicting. Think of the book of James. How great a forest is set afire by such a small spark. Those are our words. The wise man cages them up appropriately. Jesus tells us, I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. And when you think about wisdom and folly illustrated and explained in Ecclesiastes 10, who of us here has not spoken evil of someone else? Who of us here has not misused God's resources? Who of us here has not suffered the consequences of laziness or misused positions of influence to the detriment of others? Who of us here has not worn himself out with the consequences of foolish decisions? Who of us here has not revealed his foolishness through his words? Who of us here has not experienced personally the disadvantages of our own folly. All of us have acted the fool. Malcolm and Alwyn sang a song called Fool's Wisdom. And the line there says, I got myself some wisdom from a leather-bound book. And I got myself a savior when I took a second look. Something attractive about the wisdom of God and Proverbs and sections like this in Ecclesiastes. We might be tempted to think that we need wisdom to, you know, clean up our lives a little bit, make our lives a little bit better. We need some self-help. But my friends, if we stop there, that is like putting a Band-Aid on a cancer patient. We don't need just some tips for life to how to live better. We need the one who is wisdom to rescue us from our inherent natural folly. You see, even if we had all of the right wisdom principles, uh, they won't save us from the sovereignty of God. They won't save us from the wrath of God against our sin. They won't save us from the consequences of our own actions. They won't rescue us from a broken world. But Jesus will. Jesus will. We need a Savior. The great news of the Bible is that God himself is that Savior. He came in the person of his son and went to a cross to die so that everyone who would believe would be rescued from their folly, rescued from the wrath of God against sin, ultimately rescued from this broken world and given a home in heaven with him. I was going to close our time and I'll just give this to you as a homework assignment this afternoon to read 1 Corinthians 1, verses 20 to 31. There is described God's foolishness, or so it seems to a world that's infatuated with its own so-called wisdom. And what the self-styled wise world calls foolishness is actually God's infinite wisdom graciously given to fools who recognize they need it. So your assignment this afternoon is to read 
1 Corinthians 1, 20 to 31. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this elucidation of wisdom and folly, the advantages of wisdom, the disadvantages of folly, and the reminder that you're in charge of all outcomes. God, I feel my own need to practice your wisdom better, better than I have. I feel the need to practice it better than I can. And most of all, oh God, I feel that need once again for a Savior. So thankful that you sent your Son to die for me, to die in the place of all who would believe, to rescue us by the blood of his cross unto infinite glory we could never deserve. It's in his name we pray, and for his honor we sing. Amen.